Um, so I'm talking about feeding the baby. I'm going to touch on baby led weaning and some stuff that comes with that. Um, and then allergies as it comes to um, when a child is old enough to feed and then things to think about with choking and choking hazards and stuff like that. So um, there is no financial interest. I'm not getting money from anything that I talk about today. So there's no worries or anything um, from that standpoint, no disclosures I need to make. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm gonna touch on the newborn period. I know um, Cassie discussed breastfeeding and all that kind of stuff and discussed that as well. Um, we're gonna spend the most of our time talking about six month age range and when we're gonna start introducing, um, talking about baby led weaning as that's become a more prominent, interesting thing. Um, allergies and then choking as well. So talking about the newborn period, um, in the beginning, of course, all you're doing is hopefully breast milk or formula based on um, the mother's, um, you know, whatever she decides from that standpoint. Um, the first month, you're going to be doing quite a few feeds every two to three hours. Um, as they get older, you're going to do less feeds and they're going to be eating more volume. So it um, starts to kind of even out from that standpoint. Obviously, when they're really small, we aren't doing any foods. We aren't doing any um, cereal or vegetables or anything like that, just breast milk, just formula. Um, once they hit that four to five month age range, uh, most of the time closer to the five, six month age range, that's when we start thinking about, okay, are they meeting their milestones to a point where we can start talking about, should we start some baby cereal or um, baby food or, you know, things like that, and just start to mention that to families so that they can be aware um, that all those exciting, fun times are um, starting to get close. Um, as they get older, then of course you advance their food. It's not going to be just more of the purees or well, like I said, we'll talk about the baby led weaning and how that kind of plays a role. But it's not going to be the purees or the really soft things. You're going to kind of start advancing um, their food as they get older and um, as they're able to handle those types of things. Um, so this is one thing to consider again, kind of in that newborn period, and we'll just touch on it. Um, there is always the thought for mothers, am I, if they're going to breastfeed, am I making enough? Um, obviously, no one wants their little one to starve, especially if you're the sole provider as you're trying to breastfeed or something. So reminding moms that a baby's stomach is teeny tiny on day one. And if they're pumping and they're getting just a tiny little bit of um, breast milk, well, that's what your baby needs at that point. Their little belly is teeny tiny. Whereas on the other side of things, um, I've also had mothers who are concerned that their baby isn't eating enough and they're trying to feed a newborn two ounces. And then of course that comes with its own vomiting and all that stuff. So just reminding moms, your baby's stomach is absolutely teeny tiny and they're only gonna take a little bit and that's all they need right now. And as they get older, their stomach will get bigger and they'll start eating more. Um, so all of these things are kind of arranged. In the first month, um, they're gonna start taking closer to that two to four age or two to four ounces mark. Again, every baby is different. Mine did close to the, to the two to three ounces. I've seen babies taking six ounces, which is um, more than we would typically recommend because again, you're getting the vomiting, their belly is only so big, um, but just kind of ranges for those. As two months, you'd get closer to the five to six ounce range. Um, and three to five months, you're getting closer to the six ounce range um, from that standpoint. Um, again, just kind of talking about how much they're taking. Of course, as they go further along, you're gonna be looking for those cues of, um, you know, that one ounce doesn't seem to be enough anymore and they're still eating their fists or they're acting like they're starving afterwards. Um, just something to look at. It's also important to remember um, breastfeeding. Babies tend to eat less, but more frequent. And so it's okay for a mom to be like, man, I'm breastfeeding and they're wanting to eat every hour and a half to two hours because my best friend does formula and they're doing the three hour mark. And every baby is different, um, but there's also a difference between breastfeeding and formula feeding. Um, I've also had moms who said, well, I like to breastfeed during the day and then I really enjoy my sleep. So I'm doing formula at night because they do tend to sleep a little longer if they're doing formula. Um, we have the saying that breast is best and breastfeeding is best. And I think there should be a caveat to breastfeeding is best for some. 
um, maybe not everyone. Um, and just encouraging moms that this is a hard time. The newborn time is a very difficult time where everyone is stressed and exhausted and doing what's right for you and your family is the right thing to do for you and your baby. So this is where things start getting a little more exciting. Um, when you start feeding your baby. So this is my little one. This was her last year at, um, during interview season and Benjamin, I had gone out to eat and she was, I think closer to that five month age range, um, maybe a little bit before that, but she was, she had good head control. She was sitting up with support. She obviously wanted that ice cream. Um, we did not give her the ice cream, but she was very interested in food, um, and could support sit up supported. So that's one thing that you should be telling moms at that four month age range and kind of verifying and looking at as we get older and we get closer to the six months, once they're that supported sitter, that's when we can start saying, okay, well, maybe we're time to, um, good to start eating. Whereas I've seen babies at the six months where they're still just struggling with that seating, with that sitting up and they're like all slouched and kind of to the side and they don't have enough trunk control and head control to really think, um, that they're gonna do well with food. We don't want them to choke. We want it to be a good experience for everyone. Um, other things to think about is, are they opening their mouth when you start to give them something? Like if you're holding up a little spoon, you're like, okay, we're gonna try this. They're sitting up in their high chair. They aren't falling sideways or their head isn't like crunched down against them. Um, are they opening their mouth and seeming interested when food comes toward them? If you're taking a spoon and you're trying to force it into their mouth, it's not the right time. Either they're full or it's just way too early. Um, are they themselves starting to bring things to their mouth? Do they have a little rattle or whatever little toy that they're holding? Are they wanting to bring stuff to their mouth as well? Um, and they're trying to hold things. Again, if we go to the baby led weaning route and we'll talk about that, they need to have a little bit enough coordination to grab things to bring it to their mouth. And so that's something to look at. Um, it's also something to discuss with moms. Okay, well, I, and I've heard this quite a few times, especially if they start trying to do it earlier, closer to that four month um, age range. I've tried to feed them something and all they do is just keep pushing it out of their mouth and their little tongue is thrusting it out. And I've done something that they are supposed to like. It's fruit, it's delicious. Every baby loves that. And they're just spitting it right out. And some parents will think, oh, that means my baby doesn't like that that's probably we're a little too early and they don't have enough coordination to know, okay, this thing is in my mouth. I don't push it out. I'm going to try and swallow it. Um, Cause doing a bottle is very different than doing um, a spoon feeding or baby led weaning. If that's the route that you decide to take. So kind of baby food route. This was the route that I took with my little one. Um, we'll talk about kind of some pros for baby lead weaning and stuff like that. Um, I started with baby cereal. That was just my preference. It was super easy. Um, I didn't have to worry about um, anything like that or making it. So that's kind of how we went. Um, if you decide to do the baby food for whatever your preference is, Doing single food ingredients, you can buy them from wherever. They come in teeny little jars. It's to me, was very convenient. Um, and starting with single ingredient foods most of the time. So just the green beans, just the pears or whatever you decide to do um, is kind of the first step. And you'll see on the baby food, it says stage one. Um, the second stage as they get further on, you can do just a little bit more chunky and also some um, kind of mixtures. You'll see the vegetable mixture and it'll have a few different things, or sometimes they'll mix fruit with veggies, hoping the baby will like it more because veggies, they, they can smell kind of gross, just to be honest. Um, as they get older, then the baby food does come in stage three, which has small chunks. Um, every baby is different. I never could get my baby Adeline to take that. I thought it also smelled really gross. I tried it one time. I gagged and thought, oh, never buying that again. Um, but every baby is different. So that's kind of a route that you could take if you decide to do just the baby food. And then once you get older than a year, then you can start doing more of the table foods. Um, but again, this is all kind of a preference thing. And some people decide to do um, a, a different route. 
So from, from the standpoint of baby led weaning, some of you guys have probably heard about this, especially I think as it's gotten to be a more popular thought and idea. Um, so baby led weaning is the thought, I'm not gonna do any sort of that mashed baby food. I'm just gonna do table foods. Um, and this works for a lot of people and it just doesn't work for some people. Um, I will be honest, when I looked up trying to find pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses for baby led weaning, there's some very strong opinions about this, um, <laughs> whichever way you decide to go. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a, a right or wrong, kind of like with um, breast milk versus formula. Um, some of the things, strengths that I saw listed for baby led weaning, um, it gives the baby control of what they want. So what you would do is if your family is doing, let's say, I don't know, chicken and mashed potatoes or something, then you could try and put mashed potatoes on their plate or a long sliver of chicken. And in the beginning, acknowledging that they probably aren't going to eat much of anything. They're going to play in it. They're going to get very messy um, and they're just going to enjoy it. And so it gives them more control over what they're eating. Um, it can help teach them new skills such as oral and fine motor. So they're picking up what they're eating. They're putting it in their mouth. A big philosophy of, of baby led weenie is you are not putting the food in their mouth. Even if they don't seem interested, you aren't encouraging them and trying to, this is all kind of up to the baby and what they find interesting and what they want. Um, a strength could be, it allows the baby to get messy. I think that's also on the other side of things is man, it can get really messy. <laughs> Um, some people, it requires less planning. If you have a family and you love to cook and you're like, no, my baby's going to eat whatever the rest of us are eating. I cooked all of this. I worked hard. I'm not going to have to worry about going to make my own purees or go buy my own puree baby food. Um, and it lets them try a variety of different things, um, with different textures from the very beginning. Um, on the flip side of that, I am not a cook at all <laughs> not at all and so for me something like that would have required a lot more planning um because I don't cook and so it wasn't like I um, already had a meal prepared for my family it would have required a lot more planning and preparation for me and my husband is also not a cook and so that was easier in the beginning he could go get a jar of baby food and feed it to her um some of the weaknesses that you'll see mentioned, there is some concern that this approach, they're more likely to choke. Um, we will touch on that later and kind of discuss that. Um, I think acknowledging in the baby led weaning versus it's called traditional weaning, but the baby food range of things, whether they realize it or not, a majority of people are gonna do a mixture of this. Um, I didn't realize that I did a mixture of this. I went to my mother-in-law's house and we had mashed potatoes and I, gave Adam some mashed potatoes and she had macaroni and cheese and we tried a little macaroni and cheese. And that is also considered somewhat of baby led weaning. You aren't doing the puree food, you're doing table food at that time. Now I was um, too puny and didn't let Adeline feed herself the mashed potatoes because that would have again been very messy, <laughs> just not the way I wanted to go. Um, but the majority of people will do a variety of this one way or another um, for what their comfort is and what works best for their families. So this kind of discussing baby led weaning um, and some of the concerns that have come from that as this has gotten um, to be a um, somewhat touchy subject based on who you talk to. Um, there were some concerns initially that, oh, well, if you let the baby decide, there are gonna be deficiencies um, in nutrients that they need, that it's more likely for them to choke um, and that they're going to be delayed in their growth. They're going to be smaller, punier, because they aren't needing eating what their body requires. And so this study, the Bliss study, um, was one, a very large study that tried to look at these things and see, is it true there are concerns from this standpoint, or mm, no, not really. Um, so they recruited 200 families in New Zealand. Um, it stands for the Baby-Led Introduction to Solids. It was done in 2002. Um, when who re recommended starting complementary feeding at the four to six months, but then changed their mind and said no six months. And this study said, okay, well, if we're now saying six months, um, HWO, who didn't recommend 
um, or they didn't kind of discuss how to introduce those. And again, baby led weaning view was becoming a, a bigger thing at that time. Um, so in this study, they recruited 200 families. Um, you had two separate groups. You had the intervention, the bliss group, and you had the control group. And those, and for 12 months, they were um, followed. There were certain criteria they wanted the infants to be term. So um, little ones less than 30, born less than 37 weeks were not included in this. If there was some sort of congenital abnormality or physical condition or um, something that they were worried about with intellectual disability. Again, they're wanting to try and roll out that these babies grow at a good rate as other infants. And so they didn't want that to be kind of a confounding factor. Um, so things that they did in this study, it was a 12 month intervention. And then they followed up with these families um, when the infant was two years old. Both groups received standard well child care. Um, the intervention group um, got a little bit extra, something, something though. They required extra support and education from birth to 12 months. So they got professional lactation, which encouraged moms to wait until after the six month age to um, start baby led weaning. Um, they gave information like um, everyday food lists, like what can you feed the baby so that it um, kind of helps parents no, okay, well, if we're thinking about maybe these macronutrient deficiencies or concerns from that standpoint, what can I feed my baby? And encouraging those things. Um, it had recipe books. They also went to do home visits at five and a half months, again, getting closer to that six months so that everyone was ready. At the seven month age and at the nine month, they provided individual advice. So parents could ask questions, they could encourage, they could say, mm, maybe let's not do that, things like that. Um, and then they followed up from that standpoint. They also discussed um, making sure the baby, the food is soft enough for whatever that you're feeding them and that it's not something that's going to break off um, when they're eating it and become small things that they could choke on in their throat. Um, that the food should be at least the size longer than the child's fist so that they can kind of hold on to it and then it still sticks out from the end so they can kind of gnaw and chew on it. Um, with their gums. Um, they also discussed with these families that there should always be an adult monitoring. So you don't put food on the baby's tray and walk away and um, expect that everything is gonna be okay, that someone should always be watching the infant um, and encouraging them to not put baby food in the baby's mouth um, with thoughts that maybe they could choke that the baby does their own feeding. Um, during this time frame, weights were collected at the seven month age range, at the 12 months, and at the 24 um, month age. Um, I think it's also important to remember in this study that the bliss intervention was modified to make sure that we increased iron uptake, um, which did improve zinc uptake as well. So this necessarily can't be generalized to um, what you could consider unmodified baby led weaning, which is just let them eat kind of whatever you're eating, whatever that may be. Um, but the results were encouraging. So baby led weaning, they had thought maybe would show either that they had more appropriate BMIs or again, the concern that they would have lower BMIs, but it really didn't show much of a difference in BMIs in these little ones. Um, it did show that overall the bliss diet um, was nutritionally adequate as traditional spoon feeding so that they weren't deficient in these types of things. It, it's interesting, it did show that these infants were taking more sodium than they should in both groups, whether they were baby led weaning or just um, doing the baby food as um, with traditional weaning. Um, by 24 months, both groups were also doing more sugar than they should be. Um, two teaspoons a day at the one year mark. And then at the two-year-old mark, they were doing about four teaspoons a day by two years old. So both were doing more of both sugar and sodium. Um, infants following the baby led weaning approach, again, that included the encouragement with parents to mim minimize choking um, and the advice they gave from that. They didn't appear more likely to choke than infants following traditional weaning. Um, it was interesting. Um, but both groups were shown to offer foods that were high risk for choking, whether it was the traditional weaning where they gave the advice or parents doing more of the traditional weaning with baby foods and then later on offering 
um, more of the table food variety. Thoughts and overall things that they said from this study, they thought the baby led weaning approach um, lowered food fussiness. It had a higher food enjoyment because they kind of got to do what their own thing and be messy and feed themselves. Lower food responsiveness and higher, I can't say that word, satiety. How do you say that? Responsiveness in these infants. Um, so I think it was a very well done study, very interesting to see that some of the concerns um, previously mentioned were not shown to be supported in this. Um, but again, remembering that they encouraged parents to increase iron, which also helped with zinc and those types of things. Um, and so maybe not as generalizable with unmodified baby lead weaning, but still a very well done um, study in New Zealand. So this is, and I hope it's a little too small, I'm sorry. So this is kind of, it was bliss in a nutshell and kind of explained things that they did and they taught their parents in the intervention group. Um, one was start offering foods that are adult finger shaped. Again, big enough, long, skinny, a baby can hold with their hand um, as all of these pictures kind of show and that they can hold in their hand and have enough to eat on the other side. Acknowledging if it's small and tiny and a little cube, it's very hard for them to hold on to and they might not have enough dexterity to fully grasp it and get it in their mouth, especially if they're younger and it's hard to let go of things. Um, encouraging parents, and I think this is true in um, whether you do baby led weaning or you do traditional weaning, um, it's important to sit down with your little one during meal times um, for sitting down and enjoying being with your infant. And I think as they get older, then discussing school and life and things like that. Um, but they again encourage that you should sit down and that there should be an adult monitoring them at all times just to monitor for choking and that type of stuff. Um, they also encouraged offering a variety of food just to make sure that the children weren't deficient in things. Um, offering three to four pieces of different foods at a meal. So like you could do a carrot, a beef strip and a cheese stick or something like that. So they have different variety. Um, and then as they get older, you can offer more than one piece um, during that time. You don't want to overwhelm them and provide too much food, and then they don't know where to go or what to eat or um, things like that. I also encourage don't hurry your baby. Um, again, don't put things in their mouth. Don't sit down to eat and know, oh, man, we only have 15 minutes and we got to get at this. Um, kind of letting them go at their own speed. Um, so they said, avoid offering fast foods or foods that have added sugar and salt, which again, I think is a little humorous considering this did find that infants in both groups were eating more salt than they probably should and also a decent amount of sugar. Um, and then following the safety rules. So a child should be seated upright. They should be that supported sitter. You don't leave the baby alone and you don't give them things that are high likelihood of choking like peanuts and popcorn and whole grapes and stuff like that. Um, so there are a few other things in there, but that's kind of their encouragement in a nutshell to um, parents from this study. So allergies was another thing that um, I thought I would touch on. <laughs> this is my little one when we first started baby food. She was not as thrilled as I had hoped she would be. Um, but there are eight major food allergens to consider when feeding your baby from whatever standpoint you go to. Um, milk is a big one, eggs, fish, shellfish, soybeans, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts. Um, the biggest are milk, peanuts, um, fish, and eggs are some of the biggest ones, especially as they're in that age where you first start um, encouraging and trying to um, do these types of things. So this was found on the FDA website. It did mention that 90% of food allergies are from these eight foods. So acknowledging that there are other random little ones that you would never have expected that some child is gonna be um, allergic to. Oh. Um, so looking kind of at other things that was mentioned. So the LEAP study, and I do think I mentioned this on the next slide as well. Um, the LEAP study was an interesting study that was done to um, look at food allergies and um, when, to, when to introduce and when to not, and that type of thing. Um, 
kind of touching back a little bit on the baby led weaning, uh, I think depending on some of the risk factors, and we'll talk about that in a minute, it's important to um, acknowledge parents who do strict baby led weaning so they eat whatever the family is eating. If there are concerns that this child has the potential to have a allergy, um, and we'll discuss that like eczema or things like that, that maybe we should trial single foods um, during the times that we start doing that. So um, like eggs, instead of it being a whole, I don't know, um, eggs with mixed in with lots of fruits and veggies or whatever, maybe it should be just eggs that we trial and we do, especially if the child is more high risk. Um, so kind of the next thought is when. Um, Initially, there was some thought with allergies. All right, well, let's push this off um, as the infant gets older, maybe closer to the one age or further on, um, especially if there, there's concerns for food allergies. There are a few different things, um, research that has been done to kind of dissuade that. Um, there was a Finnish um, birth study that was done on 994 children that showed delaying the introduction of multiple foods, including oats and wheat, um, it was associated with an increased risk of allergic um, sensitization to food. Um, there's more recent study done in 2100 children in Canada that showed, again, delaying the introduction of milk, eggs, and peanuts beyond that first year significantly increased the odds of sensitization to these foods. Um, but the most compelling and kind of interesting data, data that was done is the LEAP study, um, which randomized 640 high-risk infants, and those are children with severe eczema or have a known allergy to um, eggs or both of those things, family history or whatever it may be, so they're considered high-risk. Um, and it showed in an either in an early age, so that 4 to 11 months, or delaying it until after 5. Um, the, show, the trial showed that um, early and regular, so three times a week um, of consumption of peanut butters, so or peanuts, whatever, in whatever form that may be, and those high-risk infants did reduce the development of peanut allergy by 86% by um, five years of age. Um, there was also the leap on, which kind of looked further on to see, okay, do they continue to be um, kind of tolerant or whatever later on? Is this something that, okay, may work in the beginning, but later on we can't quite say that as they get older? And then the leap on, it's investigated whether participants who consumed peanut butter early in the primary trial, did they remain protected from a peanut allergy after cessation of peanut consumption after 12 months? And it it did find that the benefits of early peanut butter introduction persisted after 12 months of cessation of peanut consumption. Again, supporting the concept that early peanut butter tolerance isn't a transient phenomenon. And so we should be encouraging parents to earlier on with these types of things. Um, so the thought is, okay, well, if you have concern for, is this a high risk child kind of and is it okay to say, okay, yeah, try peanut butter at home or peanuts, whatever form you decide to go with that, aside from actual like small peanuts. Um, but how should we introduce this at home? So if they have no eczema, no other food allergies, you know, this is the majority of your children who are healthy and great and growing and all the things, then introducing it at home once they're appropriate and they can sit up and all those great things, kind of how the family would like to, um, is appropriate to do. So children with mild to moderate eczema um, introduce at home at six months, but again, in a more of a, not controlled environment, but making sure it's kind of just the peanuts. You aren't mixing in with a few other things where you'd wonder, was it the peanuts? Was it something else? I'm not really sure. Um, and then a smaller subset of these children um, are the ones with severe eczema and or an egg allergy. And what should you do with those? They decided that, okay, maybe we should test them in office. Um, the big thing that they did was the peanut skin prick testing. Um, and depending on the size of that, if it's a very small zero to two millimeter, they're low risk. Okay, so maybe those little infants can also do this at home. They're lower risk, even though they have severe eczema and or an egg allergy. Um, and then kind of if a parent says, absolutely not, I'm way too nervous, I can't do this at home by myself, um, doing it in office at, at that appropriate age. If they're in that 
moderate to high risk of reaction, so the three to seven millimeters, um, you can, again, do a supervised feeding in office or sending them to a specialist. And if it's a, a very large um, area on their skin, then they're probably going to be allergic to peanuts. And that is something a specialist is much smarter than I would handle. Um, but again, I wouldn't encourage that family to um, do that at home by themselves. So this next slide that I'm going to go to kind of discusses how much peanut butter, which I guess are peanuts and what variety you decide to do that, um, which was interesting because I guess I hadn't realized that there needed to be a, a certain amount to kind of um, help with these infants and how often. So remembering three times a week, whether it's mixing the peanut butter um, in with, oh yeah, that's that one. Um, in with, with my little one, I did baby cereal because that was just the easiest thing. And I could mix it um, with milk and make it very thin. And she had already tolerated baby cereal very well. But um, just realizing that there is a certain amount that these infants should get. If you do peanut butter, doing two teaspoons. Um, so you can spread it on a piece of bread or toast and doing it in that long piece. So again, they can hold it. Um, I think that depends on the age of the infant. If you're doing peanut butter, realizing that peanut butter is real sticky. So there is a chance that they could choke. Um, so I personally would more mix it in with like the cereal or um, what variety with the fruit or something like that, acknowledging that it is very sticky. Peanuts, um, again, peanuts are very, and we'll mention this in a minute, it's very high risk for choking. Um, so grinding it, mushing it, that type of thing. And then based on that, you should do two and a half teaspoons, which would be like 10 whole peanut, peanuts that you've ground. And then mixing that powder in with the yogurt that your baby is doing or um, whatever from that standpoint. And to be honest, I don't know what Bamba is. I meant to Google it, but if someone could teach me, that'd be great. <laughs> All right, so choking. Um, I put this slide in because it's a little bit harder to kind of quantify the exact amount of choking episodes there are. This was a study done um, or released in 2021, and they kind of looked at how much, how often is choking. Um, from 2001 and to, to 2016, there was, was a total of 305,814 non-fatal injuries from choking, and there were about 2,300 deaths of choking um, in children from zero to 19. Less than five age range is your highest risk. Um, so 73% um, of that larger number had non-fatal injuries and they were less than five. And then 75% of the choking fatalities were in children less than five. It, this study also found that black children had the highest rates of choking over Hispanic or white or Asian or um, Alaskan or American Indian ethnicities. To be honest, it didn't quite touch why they thought this, um, and I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, but they did find that in the study. Um, in 2010, the AAP released new recommendations in regards to choking, kind of encouraging that, realizing that this is a big issue, and maybe we should kind of change our mind and encourage some of the big players in this um, to make changes as well. So things that they recommended and pushed for um, was for the FDA, one, to evaluate foods and require warning labels on foods that are very high risk, hoping that a parent will see that and be like, oh man, I didn't realize that was high risk for choking. Um, they also recommended that the FDA recall food products that posted a significant and a unacceptable choking hazard. I don't know how they quantified that. Um, number three, they established a national food-related choking incident surveillance and reporting system um, to warn the public and let others know that these are hazards to children. Um, and four, to focus on resources and prevention programs, um, at which point, again, they very much encourage the health healthcare professionals to realize that as these children get to this age, um, that we need to be mentioning the hot dogs and the peanuts and all those types of things. Um, as an intern, I did have a mom come and tell me, we were talking about what her little one's favorite food was and she mentioned peanuts. Um, 
And people do do that. And it's, she is a wonderful mother. She's actually my neighbor. She's wonderful. She just didn't realize that that's very high risk for choking because she just said her little one loved to like gnaw on them. But it takes one incident of that little peanut to get stuck and um, bad things to happen. Um, after 2010, the rates of choking decreased. Um, but the zero to four age range is still the highest risk of choking in infants. So this was another um, study that was done in 1,151 mothers with infants four to 12 months who had started solid foods. Um, they gauged how often was choking in these infants. It, it showed that 13.6% of infants, so 155, had ever choked. Um, the big thing with this, of these infants, um, there were three groups. So there was a strict baby led weaning group. There was a, a loose baby led, led weaning group. So they were doing purees and some of the baby led weaning stuff like I did with Adeline. And then the traditional weaning style. Um, so they looked at frequency of spoon feeding and puree um, use. Um, they looked at um, having these mothers recall, trying to see what their infant had choked on, how they had choked, um, like what they had choked on, how often that had been. Was it lumpy or pureed or finger food, um, things like that. Um, so interestingly enough, um, there was no difference between the three groups. So there wasn't a significant difference between the strict baby led weaning, the loose, or the pureed, um, and if they had ever choked. There are obviously some limitations to this. You're asking a mother to try and remember, oh, three months ago, did my child choke on that food? And of course, sometimes if it's a very traumatizing thing for the mother and the child, yes, the mom's going to remember it. Um, but some of that limitation due to recall bias is noted. Um, it also mentioned some of the limitations in this study is most of the time women who fill out these um, type surveys in this type research tend to be older and more well-educated um, and higher percent of professional um, occupations than just maybe a common um, person out at Walmart or something like that. Um, so this came directly from the CDC website and it's discussing um, potential choking hazards in young children. You'll notice you'll have a box for fruits and veggies, which mentions a lot about um, raw things. Anything that's a circle, um, whether it's a cherry or a grape tomato or grapes themselves, um, blueberries, those are high risk. Um, it mentions grain products, so like granola bars that are hard that can kind of break off and again, kind of form like a hard nugget in your throat. Um, breads with seeds, sweetened foods, so like those gummy things that look like little um, um, oranges, obviously those are high risk. Um, and then proteins, so nuts and seeds, those small things, um, hot dogs, meat sticks, sausages, large hunks of cheese, you have to be careful with that um, if it's hard and they've broken off a little piece and then it gets stuck. So this was a, a very interesting thing. It was actually on the um, CDC website, but the link says it comes from WIC. Um, and it mentions reducing the risk of choking hazards in young children at mealtimes. It mentions that you could print this off and give this to your parents when they come in. Um, and I thought it showed just a great representation of like small round things um, should be cut small. A lot of the time I'll tell my parents if they want, if that baby wants the grapes, cut them lengthways, which can be, take a lot of time. Um, but encouraging the parents, like, if you have a grape, I'm not going to cut it so it's still a circle. That's still something that they could get choked on. Their airway is teeny tiny. Um, so we may think, oh, that blueberry is teeny tiny, but their airway is also very small. Um, so I thought this was a great thing. It also mentions chewing gum, um, dried fruit, kind of more of the hard type things could get stuck. Um, this was the back page of it and kind of how to cut things um, and then teaching good feeding habits and little ones requiring, you know, allowing them plenty of time to eat so we aren't rushing them, at which point they're more likely to get choked, encouraging everyone to not let their child run around while they're eating a snack and be playing, again, higher risk of choking. Let's sit down, let's eat, let's enjoy um, eating together during these times. 
And then it had a cute little questionnaire on the back which had the answers on it. This is um, a wonderful website that Dr. Lane told me about. Um, so it talks about safe food sizes and shapes for babies. And I'm gonna click on it and hopefully it'll let me do what I'm hoping it will. Um, I'm hoping everyone, I don't know if they can see this or not, but I'll talk about it and I'm sorry if you guys can't see it. <laughs> um, but it's called First Foods and it's a whole database of if you're going to do this food, how could you introduce it? How could you cut it? How can you cook it? Um, which I thought was really great. So something like strawberries, you can click on strawberries and it says, okay, age suggestion, greater than six months. This is the nutritional rating. I have no idea how they figure that out, but um, how much prep time it takes to cook it. Um, when can they eat it? What type of strawberry varieties are there? And then it gives these really adorable videos of different little ones at different ages and how they were either cut based on the age um, and how the infants were eating it at, at that age. So like at seven months, it mentions they should be doing a whole strawberry, acknowledging that if you have teeny tiny little strawberries, again, that small, they're gonna choke on that. If it's a big strawberry where they can't fit the whole thing in their mouth and they can just kind of gnaw on it, like a little chipmunk, um, then that's definitely considered safer. Um, there was some food that I had never even heard of on here. Like, I don't know what a lotus root is, but again, like I, I thought it was absolutely fascinating and it's free and it gives you different examples of how to cook it. And is it a common allergen? And, you know, can it help them poop? I don't know. Lots of wonderful things for maybe not great for every single patient if you're in a hurry and this isn't um, good for them, but I've definitely had parents who were very nervous about starting feeding with their little one, um, and this is something that I think they might have absolutely really loved. Um, there are lots of other things on this website as well. I wish I could go back to the main page, um, but it talks about how to cut your food, the baby's food. Um, it has recipes for different stuff. Um, and there are lots and lots of food on here, um, greater than 11 pages of different food that you could do. Um, so that was one thing that I really thought was great. So thank you, Dr. Lane, for telling me about it. Um, and it has lots of things other than that, as you can see, starting solids, when to start them, how to start them, stuff like that. Um, this is Adeline as she was trying to eat, and I just thought it was adorable. She was trying to use her spoon. We're working on it. Um, so this was her later on, um, again, acknowledging that I didn't do the baby led weaning route, but feeding is messy and lots of fun too. Um, just to kind of touch as we're talking about choking, um, de-choking devices. Um, these are two of the more common de-choking devices that I could find online. Um, so one is the Life Vac. Um, it has a face mask. It looks kind of like a plunger, to be honest, that you would use. Um, the other is the de-choker, and it has different face mask sizes um, that are supposedly appropriate based on that child's age and size. And it is also kind of a plunger that you would pull back. And um, as long as you created a good seal, hopefully it had enough to um, kind of get whatever is obstructing out. There is very limited data on these types of things. Um, and I decided to look in this because I think it's interesting, but my mother has also been asking a lot. I saw this one thing about this and I think it's great and we should buy it. And um, I had no idea. And so I told her, well, all right, let's not, let me look at it. Um, but there's very limited data on this. This is one of the better research things that I could um, find. It was done in 2019. 92 individuals were randomized to one of six groups, which is that left-sided picture. Um, only 90 of the people were included because two of the cases didn't actually do the um, procedure or whatever they were asking correctly. So after they got split into these six groups, they were given a brief chat on how to use the de-choker and how to use the life back. They weren't able to practice with it. Um, it was just a very quick, okay, you put it on the mouth and this is how it's done. Um, it was a mannequin study on an adult mannequin. Um, and it was a small, hard, circular object that was placed in the mannequin's mouth. Um, so overall, as you look at the picture on the right, you'll see this was the time that it took to remove whatever that was in their throat. 
um, and then how successful they were. Um, so overall, they said, okay, the life back was found to be more successful in removing whatever that obstruction was than using abdominal thrust. So that blue line is life back. The green one is abdominal thrust. They said there was no evidence of improved success from the D-choker versus doing abdominal thrusts. Um, I think there are lots of limitations to this. One, it was a very small group. It was only 90 people were included in it. It was also um, medical students that were included. So these are people who have had BLS and have practiced um, abdominal thrust. They know how to make sure that this mask fits on a mannequin's face or someone's face and how to hold it and really get that good seal because these you have to get a good seal or it's not going to work at all. Um, and they had previously had BLS. Things to consider when thinking about is the D choker or the life factor or whatever. Um, abdominal thrusts don't require additional equipment. So if a little one starts choking, you don't have to run to your car or go and find it or anything like that. Um, you can decide, okay, well, yes, they're definitely choking um, and I need to do something about it. Um, and then acknowledging that this study they tried to say there was a lot found from it. I think it's less likely to be generalized. These are medical students who have had BLS and how, know how to do these things. Whereas the general public, they aren't gonna have someone making sure they know how to get a really good seal. Um, there was some concern mentioned as well with the D choker is that um, circular piece that goes in the mouth, is that gonna cause a little bit of trauma to the oral mucosa as well? Um, so I think whichever route your patient or you decide to say in this, um, knowing abdominal thrust to BLS is gonna be important. Um, so as if you have someone who is little, so not a full adult, getting down on your knees, getting behind them, wrapping your arms around their um, waist, and then doing um, the Heimlich remover. Um, if they're a little infant, again, remembering you hold them in your arm with their head lower, you do the back, um, slap, or thrust, whatever you want to call it, five times, you flip them over, make sure you don't see anything in their mouth, and then you push on their chest um, five times, and kind of continuing this, um, and acknowledging that, especially if we have nervous parents who have ever had a child who choked, or just want to be educated, that we can kind of explain this and encourage them to know how to do it. So this is my little one, at her one-year birthday, and she ate cake for the first time and was absolutely thrilled. Um, while I'm thinking about it with choking, it's very normal for infants to gag. Um, and that is not a necessarily a choking behavior. New textures are gonna cause little ones to gag. Um, so anyways, just some interesting things that I learned that I was hoping you guys would find interesting as well. I would like to thank Dr. Lane um, for all of her insight and her pointers. And I couldn't have done this without her. Um, and then the medical library for sending me a lot of the research, which was helpful kind of getting through all of this stuff. Um, and I'm sorry, the word, the letters are very small. These are my citations. And that's all I have.